Um, I'm Liza Bernard. I'm the programming librarian here at Norman Williams. And for those of you who are new to the area or visiting, um, the library was built in 1883. And we are, as you can tell, so fortunate to have this amazing historic building in which to host a wide range of programs such as this. And we do appreciate your support, both your active participation and your generous contributions. But today, we get to celebrate with Hamilton Gillett, who grew up here in Woodstock and is known around here as the recycling guru. He currently is the outreach coordinator for two local solid waste management districts and gives frequent presentations and programs. But perhaps a lesser known fact is that Ham is an accomplished actor. He holds a BA in theater English from UVM and an MFA in acting from UNC Chapel to Hill. He has taught about, he's performed in, he's written, and he's produced, play, uh, produced events. And for more than two decades, we haven't got the exact number, but we know it's more than two decades, he has read A Child's Christmas at Wales at the library here during Woodstock's Wassail Weekend. So please join me in welcoming Ham Gillett back again. taking recycling questions after the show. <laughs> and um, I think I saw Dolly Parton on the green earlier. I, did anybody else see her? No. Um, so thank you all for coming. And um, I want to um, give a special, I don't want to shout out, but I want to thank, and uh, you know who you are, my faithful audience members who I think have come every single year. So, and they were, they were the first ones in the seats, and uh, I look forward to seeing your smiling faces. Um, I'm going to go through, there are a number of words in here that you may or may not know but I'm gonna go through them so that when they pop up, if you have never heard of this particular word, uh, you will know what it is. And usually, pretty much everybody knows, but um, here we go. Um, a muffler, not on a car, right? Your scarf, okay, galoshes, boots, rubber boots, right? Uh, uh, a tam shanter Yes, it's a wool hat. Usually sometimes it has a pom-pom on the top. They're Scottish, or, right? I think they're Scottish. Um, a tea cozy is what you put your teapot under. Or, yeah, it's like a quilted thing to keep your tea warm. Um, a busby. This one, this one tricks some people. Uh, one of my veteran audience members knows, it's the, the guards at Buckingham Palace wear the big, tall, black, fuzzy things. That's a busby. Uh, I had to look that one up. A balaclava is what you wear when it's really cold skiing or you want to rob a bank. It's got the holes in the... <clears throat> um, a sugar fag. Interesting. It's a candy cigarette. A fag is a cigarette. And uh, you'll find that in Shakespeare. And... Um, a sugar fag is a sugar cigarette. Um, crackers are the things that, that you have uh, by your place at, at, at Christmas, and you pull them, and they pop, and all these things fall out sometimes. <laughs> um, spats. Spats are things that gentlemen used to wear to cover up their, the buckles on their boots and it's, they're, sometimes they're white, more times they're black, I think. Um, just a few more, a briar is a pipe. Uh, Leonardo refers to Leonardo da Vinci. Um, a bowler is a hat like Charlie Chaplin wore. And uh, this one I just added because I was rereading it the other day and I thought, oh, um, Pompeii is where Mount Vesuvius exploded and killed the entire population of Pompeii. 
So there we go. Now we can start. By the way, um, Dylan Thomas was born in 1914. His father used to read Shakespeare aloud to him. Uh, he died in New York City at the age of 39 from um, acute alcohol poisoning. Very sad. And uh, this was not, he died in 1953, and this story was not actually published, published until 1955. And if you ever have a chance to listen to the recording of Dylan Thomas reading this, it's stunning, and I, I would recommend it highly. It's on Cadman Records, and uh, it's just beautiful. So, Okay. <clears throat> One Christmas was so much like another in those years around the tea town corner, now and out of all sound, except the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep, that I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was 12, or whether it snowed for 12 days and 12 nights when I was six. All the Christmases rolled down toward the two-tongued sea, like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street. And they stop at the rim of the ice-edged, fish-freezing waves, and I plunge my hands in the snow, and I bring out whatever I can find. In goes my hand into that wool-white, bell-tongued ball of holidays resting at the rim of the carol-singing sea, and out come Mrs. Prothero and the firemen. It was on the afternoon of the day of Christmas Eve and I was in Miss Prothero's garden waiting for cats with her son Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December in my memory is white as Lapland, though there were no reindeer. But there were cats, patient, cold, and callous, our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball the cats. Sleek and long as jaguars and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slink and sidle over the white back garden walls. And the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, fur-capped and moccasin trappers from Hudson Bay off Mumbles Road would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still, Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows, eternal ever since Wednesday, that we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden. Or if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder. Fire! cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner gong. And we ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms toward the house, and smoke indeed was pouring out of the dining room, and the gong was bombolating, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing on the wall in a row. We bounded into the house, laden with snowballs, and stopped at the open door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning, all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Prother who always slept there after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face. But he was standing in the middle of the room saying, a fine Christmas, and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, cried Mrs. Prother as she beat the gong. They won't be there, Mr. Prother said. It's Christmas. There was no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke, and Mr. Prothero standing in the middle of them, waving his slipper as though he were conducting. Do something, he said. And we threw all our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Prothero. 
and ran out of the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said, and the ambulance, and Ernie Jenkins, he likes fires. <laughs> but we only called the fire brigade, and soon the fire engine came, and three tall men in helmets brought a hose into the house, and Mr. Prothero got out just in time before they turned it on. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas Eve. And when the firemen turned off the hose and were standing in the wet, smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero, came downstairs and peered in at them. She said the right thing always. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs, and she said, would you like anything to read? <laughs> years and years and years ago when I was a boy, when there were wolves in Wales and birds the color of red flannel petticoats whisked past the harp-shaped hills, when we sang and wallowed all night and day in caves that smelt like Sunday afternoons in damp front farmhouse parlors, and we chased with the jawbones of deacons, the English, and the bears. Before the motor car, before the wheel, before the duchess-faced horse, when we rode the daft and happy hills bareback, it snowed and it snowed. But here a small boy says, it snowed last year too. I made a snowman and my brother knocked it down and then I knocked my brother down and then we had tea. That was not the same snow, I say. Our snow was not only shaken from whitewash buckets down the sky, it came shawling up out of the ground and swam and drifted out of the arms and hands and bodies of the trees. Snow grew overnight on the roofs of the houses like a pure and grandfather moss, minutely white ivied the walls and settled on the postman opening the gate like a dumb, numb thunderstorm of white, torn Christmas cards. Were there postmen then, too? With sprinkling eyes and wind-cherried noses, on spread frozen feet they crunched up to the doors and mittened on them manfully, but all that the children could hear was a ringing of bells. You mean that the postmen went rat-a-tat-tat? And the doors rang? I mean that the bells that the children could hear were inside them. I only hear thunder sometimes, never bells. They were church bells, too. Inside them? No, no, no. In the bat black, snow white belfries tugged by bishops and storks. And they rang their tidings over the bandaged town over the frozen foam of the powder and ice cream hills, over the crackling sea. It seemed that all the churches boomed for joy under my window, and the weathercocks crew for Christmas on our fence. Get back to the postman. They were just ordinary postmen, fond of walking and dogs and Christmas and the snow. They knocked on the doors with blue knuckles, Ours has got a black knocker. And then they stood on the white welcome mat in the little drifted porches and huffed and puffed, making ghosts with their breath and jogged from foot to foot like small boys wanting to go out. And then the presents. And then the presents after the Christmas box. And the cold postman with a rose on his button nose tingled down the tea tray slithered run of the chilly glinting hill. He went in his ice-bound boots like a man on fishmonger's slabs. He wagged his bag like a frozen camel's hump, dizzily turned the corner on one foot, and by God he was gone. Get back to the presents. There were useful presents engulfing mufflers of the old coach days and mittens made for giant sloths. 
zebra scarves of a substance that like silky gum that could be tug of war down to the galoshes. Blinding tam shanters like patchwork tea cozies and bunny-suited busbies and balaclavas for victims of head-shrinking tribes. From aunts who always wore wool next to the skin, there were mustached and rasping vests that made you wonder why the aunts had any skin left at all. And once I had a little crocheted nose bag from an aunt, now, alas, no longer whinnying with us. And pictureless books in which small boys, though warned with quotations not to, would skate on Farmer Giles' pond and did and drowned. And books that told me everything about the wasp except why. Go on to the useless presents. Bags of moist and many colored jelly babies and a folded flag and a false nose and a tram conductor's cap and a machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Never a catapult. Once by mistake that no one could explain, a little hatchet. And a celluloid duck that made when you pressed it a most unduck-like sound. A mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow and a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the sea, and the animals any color I pleased. And still the dazzling sky blue sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow billed and pea green birds. Hard boils, toffee, fudge, and all sorts. Crunches, cracknels, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter welsh for the Welsh and troops of bright tin soldiers who, if they could not fight, could always run. And snakes and families and happy ladders and easy hobby games for little engineers, complete with instructions, oh, easy for Leonardo. And a whistle to make the dogs bark, to wake up the old man next door, to make him beat on the wall with a stick to shake our picture off the wall. And a packet of cigarettes. You put one in your mouth, and you stood at the corner of the street, and you waited for hours in vain for an old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette. And then with a smirk, you ate it. And then it was breakfast under the balloons. <clears throat> Were there uncles like at our house? There are always uncles at Christmas. The same uncles, and on Christmas mornings with dog disturbing whistle and sugar fags, I would scour the watched town for the news of the little world and find always a dead bird by the white post office or by the deserted swings, perhaps a robin, all but one of his fires out. Men and women wading or scooping back from the chapel with tap room noses and wind bust cheeks, all albinos huddled their stiff, black, jarring feathers against the irreligious snow. Mistletoe hung from the gas brackets in all the front parlors. There was sherry and walnuts and bottled beer and crackers by the dessert spoons, and cats in their furabouts watched the fires, and the high-heaped fire spat, all ready for the chestnuts and mulling pokers. Some few large men sat in the front parlors without their collars, uncles almost certainly, trying their new cigars, holding them out judiciously at arm's length, returning them to their mouths, coughing, then holding them out again as though waiting for the explosion. And some few small aunts, not wanted in the kitchen, nor anywhere else for that matter, sat on the very edges of their chairs, poised and brittle, afraid to break like faded cups and saucers. Not many those mornings trod the piling streets, an old man always, fawn bowlered, yellow gloved, and at this time of year with spats of snow, would take his constitutional to the white bowling green and back as he would take it wet or fine on Christmas Day or Doomsday. 
Sometimes, two hale young men with big pipes blazing, no overcoats, and wind-blown scarves would trudge unspeaking down to the forlorn sea to work up an appetite, to blow away the fumes, who knows, to walk into the waves until nothing of them was left but the two curling smoke clouds of their inextinguishable briars. Then I would be slap dashing home, the gravy smell of the dinner of others, the bird smell, the brandy, the pudding and mince coiling up to my nostrils, when out of a snow-clogged side lane would come a boy the spit of myself with a pink-tipped cigarette and the violet past of a black eye, cocky as a bullfinch leering all to himself. I hated him on sight and sound and would be about to put my dog whistle to my lips and blow him off the face of Christmas when suddenly he, with a violet wink, put his whistle to his lips and blew so stridently, so high, so exquisitely loud that gobbling faces, their cheeks bulged with goose, would press against their tinseled windows the whole length of the white echoing street. For dinner we had turkey and blazing pudding, and after dinner the uncle sat in front of the fire, loosened all buttons, put their large moist hands over their watch chains, groaned a little, and slept. Mothers, aunts, and sisters scuttled to and fro bearing tureens. Auntie Bessie, who had already been frightened twice by a clockwork mouse, whimpered at the sideboard and had some elderberry wine. The dog was sick. Auntie Dosie had to have three aspirins, but Auntie Hannah, who liked port, stood in the middle of the snowbound backyard, singing like a big-bosomed thrush. I would blow up balloons to see how big they would blow up to, and when they burst, which they all did, the uncles jumped and rumbled. In the rich and heavy afternoon, the uncles breathing like dolphins and the snow descending, I would sit among festoons and Chinese lanterns and nibble dates and try to make a model man of war following the instructions for little engineers and produce what might be mistaken for a seagoing tram car. Or I would go out, my bright new boots squeaking into the white world onto the seaward hill to call on Jim and Dan and Jack and to pad through the still streets, leaving huge, deep footprints on the hidden pavements. I'll bet people think they'll be, there have been hippos. What would you do if you saw a hippo coming down our street? I'd go like this, bang! I'd throw him over the railings and roll him down the hill, and then I'd tickle him under the ear and he'd wag his tail. What would you do if you saw two hippos? Iron flanked and bellowing, he hippos clanked and battered through the scudding snow towards us as we passed Mr. Daniel's house. Let's post Mr. Daniel a snowball through his letterbox. Let's write things in the snow. Let's write, Mr. Daniel looks like a spaniel all over his lawn. Or we walked on the white shore. shore. Can the fishes see it snowing? The silent, one-clouded heavens drifted onto the sea. Now we were snow-blind travelers, lost on the north hills, and vast, dew-lapped dogs with flasks round their necks ambled and shambled up to us, baying excelsior. We returned home through the poor streets, where only a few children fumbled with bare red fingers in the wheel-rutted snow, and cat-called after us, their voices fading away as we trudged uphill into the cries of the dock birds and the hooting of ships out in the whirling bay. And then at tea, the recovered uncles would be jolly, and the ice cake loomed in the center of the table like a marble grave, Auntie Hannah laced her tea with rum, because it was only once a year. Bring out the tall tales now that we told by the fire as the gaslight bubbled like a diver. Ghosts, 
cooed like owls in the long nights when I dared not look over my shoulder. Animals lurked in the cubby hole under the stairs where the gas meter ticked. And I remember that we went singing carols once when there wasn't a shaving of a moon to light the flying streets. At the end of a long road was a drive that led to a large house and we stumbled up the darkness of the drive that night, each one of us afraid each one holding a stone in his hand in case, and all of us too brave to say a word. The wind through the trees made noises as of old and unpleasant and maybe web-footed men wheezing in caves. We reached the black bulk of the house. What shall we give them? Hark the herald? No, Jack said. Good King Wenceslas, I'll count three. One, two, three. And we began to sing. Our voices high and seemingly distant in the snow-felted darkness round the house that was occupied by nobody we knew. We stood close together near the dark door. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. And then a small, dry voice, like the voice of someone who has not spoken for a very long time, joined our singing. A small, dry, eggshell voice from the other side of the door. A small, dry voice through the keyhole. And when we stopped running, we were outside our house. The front room was lovely. The balloons floated under the hot bottle, gulping gas. Everything was good again and shone over the town. Perhaps it was a ghost, Jim said. Perhaps it was trolls, Dan said, who was always reading. Let's go in and see if there's any jelly left, Jack said. And we did that. Always on Christmas night, there was music. An uncle played the fiddle, a cousin sang Cherry Ripe, and another uncle sang Drake's drum. It was very warm in the little house. Auntie Hannah, who had got onto the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death. And then another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest. And then everybody laughed again. And then I went to bed. Looking through my bedroom window, out into the moonlight, and the unending smoke-colored snow. I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses on our hill and hear the music rising from them up the long, steadily falling night. I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness, and then I slept. <laughs>